Good morning. Please be seated. Welcome to Fellowship Congregational United Church of Christ. We are an open and affirming faith community dedicated to growing in spirit and working for justice. If this is your first time here or your 10,000th time here or you're joining us uh, online, we want to say welcome to worship. And I want to start with some breaking news. Uh, On the last day here of the Olympics, I'm pleased to report that the U.S. women's basketball team has won a gold medal, 67 to 66. That is, uh, let's see, that is 61 straight Olympic wins and eight straight gold medals. And I promise that's my second to last Olympics reference. (laughs) Friends, we are working on our accessibility at the church through the work of the Wider Welcome Task Force. Um, So I do want you to please note that we do have large print uh, bulletins available in the Narthex. We've actually had them for several weeks, but we thought, hey, maybe we want to let people know that we have them. (laughs) It's a crazy idea, I realize. Uh, And we do have uh, hearing amplification devices, so if you need that, just see Scott uh, in the AV booth. As many of you know, uh, and maybe as many of you live, we are currently experiencing a great rise in depression and anxiety, especially for particular demographics. That's one reason we are holding a special lunch and learn after worship today on a suicide prevention strategy called Question Persuade, Refer, or QPR. Uh, This is not meant to be a comprehensive solution to this crisis, not at all, or to equip any of us to be able to offer what mental health professionals can offer. This is a one-hour workshop teaching how to initiate a conversation about suicide if you are worried that someone might be suicidal, and then how to steer them to the proper resources. A representative from the Mental Health Association of Oklahoma will be presenting, and there will be a lunch available. And even if you haven't signed up, you are more than welcome to attend. Just head straight across the sidewalk into our fellowship hall after worship today. Friends, let's start our worship together by passing the peace like this. Peace be with you. May we take a moment and pass that peace along to those sitting around us. As we find our way back to our seats, I invite us uh, to join together in the call to worship. We are made in the image of an eternally creative God. Another world is possible and on its way. We are made to be in collaboration, to care for each other, to build sustainable community. Another world is possible and on its way. This is the truth about us. It has always been and always will be. A new world is both here and arriving. We wait for it, we usher it in, and we greet it as hopeful people. Amen. The kids are going to head off now to Children's Church. All our kids and people who feel like kids and head out with Mr. Justin.
The scripture reading is from 1 Kings, 19th chapter, beginning verse 1. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all Baal's prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with this message. May the gods do whatever they want to me, to me if by this time tomorrow I haven't made your life like the life of one of them. Elijah was terrified. He got up and ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah and left his assistant there. He himself went farther on into the desert a day's journey. He finally sat down under a solitary broom bush. He, he longed for his own death. It's more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. He lay down and slept under the solitary broom bush. Then suddenly, a messenger tapped him and said to him, Get up. Eat something. Elijah opened his eyes and saw flat bread baked on glowing coals and a jar of water right by his head. He ate and drank and then went back to sleep. The Lord's messenger returned a second time and tapped him. Get up, the messenger said. Eat something because you have a difficult road ahead. Elijah got up, ate and drank, and went refreshed by that food for 40 days and nights until he arrived at Horeb, God's mountain. These are words from our tradition. God grant us to wisdom and courage for interpretation. One of last week's church signs out here gathered more comments on it than usual, and that's saying something given the signs we put up. <laughs> the sign read, when you are tired, learn to rest, not quit. And I put that on there because I was tired, like down to my soul tired, and I really identified with that phrase. We had not yet had an infusion of hope from political possibilities. Everything was way too hot, unlike this weekend. And COVID was rearing its ugly head again, which always induces a little PTSD-like reaction in me. Uh, I wore masks, for instance, constantly and with zero complaint during the pandemic, and now I can't seem to tolerate them. <laughs> On top of all of that, the weight of the constant breaking news and the reactionary, often rude politics of the day do little to inspire anyone to hope or peace. It all had me feeling like quitting. And not this job or anything like that, but kind of quitting the world, you know? Like using the privilege I have to retreat into a bubble and just focus on me and mine. You ever feel like that? I know many of you have and even do because we talk about it. It's the hopelessness that seems to saturate so much of our lives, in part because our institutions have failed us repeatedly, and also because things feel like they're getting worse. Or is that just me? Oh, sure, I could give you statistics about crime rates going way down, which they are, or about poverty rates actually decreasing, or how right now more of humanity has access to food and education and cleaner water and safer sanitation than ever before. But those things don't feel true, do they? We see the people on our own streets. We know about housing inequities and economic disparity and don't feel safer even if that's what the statistics say. 
some of what is a factor for all of that hopelessness might be our attitude about change. Is change possible? In this pattern of the impact and inaction around climate change, a sustained wave of economic inequality, the grim status of at least two wars right now, and the coming election, we've all likely wondered not only how things will change, but if that change is even possible. Perhaps this is the case because we think of change in the framework of saving. We think of someone or something coming in to save the day. As Rebecca Solnit says in her brilliant collection of essays called Hope in the Dark, saving is the wrong word. It suggests a laying up where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt. It imagines an extraction from the dangerous unstable, ever-changing process called life on earth. Life is never so tidy or final. In our story from 1 Kings today, the prophet Elijah is on the run. He achieves a great victory supported by Yahweh against the followers of another god called Baal, a victory which involves a lot of of brutal violence. That's another sermon. In achieving this victory, he also ticks off Queen Jezebel of the Baal clan, who sends a message through her messenger, kind of like this to Elijah. As God is my witness, I'm coming for you, and you ought to expect the same treatment you gave to my people. Ooh. Elijah, our text says, was terrified, and he flees for his life out into the desert where he sits down under a bush with this sort of hopeless despair, seeking salvation and maybe just an end to it all. And God comes to visit in the form of a malak, a Hebrew word which is translated in some versions as an angel. Now, Here's a little side note. You might have noticed that our translation this morning, the common English version, translated this word as messenger. It was a messenger from God. That is because it's the same word used for the person that Queen Jezebel sends to threaten Elijah before he flees. And there... It is translated just a few sentences earlier by virtually every translation as messenger. So why translate the same word two different ways? Well, one messenger is in league with Queen Jezebel, and we know all about her. I mean, that can't be an angel, right? So I'm just going to leave it up to you as to what to do with all that, but will simply remind us that these kinds of interpretive choices run all throughout our Bibles, all of which are translations. End of side note. So depending on the way that we interpret things, God sends an angel uh, or some other person, a messenger from a friend, somebody shows up. And I guess maybe those could all be the same thing, right? Anyway, this messenger has some really good advice for Elijah, tired and distraught under a tree in the dry desert searching for salvation. Hey, Elijah, come on, man. You have a difficult road ahead of you. Have a snack. (laughs) Have some water. Get some sleep. Now, maybe you don't think about that as sort of angel-level advice. Uh, But let me suggest to you that it is nothing short of miraculous. How often in the middle of our most stressful times do we forget the basics? To get some proper nutrition, to drink enough water, especially this time of year, and to rest our bodies. That is godly guidance, friends, and we ought to listen to it. If I said that these were stressful times, even hopeless 
times. It might feel like an understatement and an echo at the same time because I've been saying this to you all upon repeat. As of late, maybe you've begun to feel maybe a little hope on the horizon or maybe you feel like it's there but it's just like a drop in the ocean. Either way, I think we can all identify with this sense that we have some retooling to do with our hope engines. In our story, Elijah is also under a lot of pressure. His hope meter is on empty. Now, he's dedicated to his cause, for sure, in a way that is much more brutal and violent than I am comfortable with. But perhaps he's seen that the violence is only a catalyst for retribution. Perhaps he's getting a glimpse here now about how that's a downward spiral, just going to come back and visit him. Still, his frustration and passion for the way of the Lord, as our text says, which he sees as a covenant that is being broken, is very tangible. Even something I can sort of identify with, except for the violence part. After all, isn't that part of what our stress is about too? I see some failing of what I thought was a social contract all around us. The common good. The promise of equality and justice as an ideal, as something that we're reaching for all the time. The, the idea that freedom is only freedom if it's for everyone, otherwise it's privilege. I thought these were covenant values, something that everyone held, even if we saw different paths to get to those goals. But now I'm not so sure. It feels like so many people are far off of that path. Resistant, if not oppositional, to a covenant of equality, seeking instead to enforce some kind of partial equality or the equality where everyone is equal, only some are more equal than others. And yes, violence and the threat of violence are very much a part of all of that these days, too. And since we want that to change because we want better days, we want a better world. We engage in all kinds of activism to, to save voting rights or unjust situations or even democracy itself. But this all feels so unta- unattainable sometimes. As Solnit also observes in her book, activism seems to specialize in bitterness and cynicism and defeatism because things don't change, certainly not overnight. And we come quickly to learn that we have as much control over the weather system of society as we do the weather around us. And take a look, we ain't got no control. (laughs) We might be able to forecast a few days, but who in the world knows what next month will look like? Plus, we just get tired, right? I mean... We live where we live, we face so many problems, and it often feels like we're swimming upstream against a hard current. It can be tempting to find some shade somewhere and just sit down and quit. Elijah seems to have made such a decision, and I can appreciate it. But as the story goes on, he gets some direct and divine intervention, and his fate is not quite what he thought it might be as he initially sat down under that tree. It's a nice turn to the story, friends, but none of that would have ever happened without him taking the advice to rest and recharge. He goes on another 40 days and 40 nights off of some bread and some water, right? Had he not not done that, had he not taken that advice, he'd still be sitting under that tree unavailable to a future he could not see at that moment. One of the deepest lessons we can learn as people who really do want to change the world, as grand as that sounds, is the lesson of learning to rest when we are tired rather than to quit. Not only is that important for us as individuals to care for our bodies and souls, but it also reminds us that we are like a raft pilot on whitewater rapids. We're able to steer some, but mostly guiding our path as best we can in a river that is really in charge. And the rest, 
that rejuvenation. It, it gives us a moment to regroup and to think about different approaches, like moving aside into an eddy and just waiting there for a second as we replan our strategy for the river ahead. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been reading and rereading some books on the practice of nonviolence, mostly as an exercise for myself to remember some of my core values. I have been, I will admit, a little bit more prone to the burn it all down approach, uh, which I recognize in myself, but don't particularly want to feed any longer. In reading on that topic, you are likely, if not guaranteed, regardless of the author, to encounter the words of Mahatma Gandhi. Only the quote I will share with you is not about the importance of nonviolence or some great wisdom quote on spiritual centering, although maybe it's a little bit of both of those. Gandhi once said, there has to be more to life than increasing its speed. I think that was his way of talking about purpose. We often think of ourselves as human doings, not human beings, and we dedicate very little time to the habit of being. Output, action, generation, our time must be spent productively, the society tells us. And if you need more vitamins or a better workout or giant coffee drinks or, on the other side, gummies and cocktails to contend with the stress, you know, that's all part of it. Giant coffee in the morning, gummies at night. Yes. <laughs> There's another approach, though. And since we're on the last day of the Olympics, my aforementioned last uh, mention of the Olympics, we've still got time, you know, to make a few references. Elite athletes like the ones that we have been seeing, they come in all shapes and sizes. Have you noticed this? The kinds of strength or skill one needs for archery or for rock climbing, they're very different than what is needed for the 100-meter sprint or for a gold medal in soccer, go, S go U.S. Women's National Team. <laughs> One of the common denominators, however, is the need for rest and rejuvenation. More breaking news, exerting yourself makes you tired. And that exertion can come from physical work or from mental work, emotional, spiritual work. Our bodies and our souls need to rest. Even God, our creation stories say, took an entire day off. This is particularly crucial at a time in which the stakes seem awfully high. There's so much work to do to repair our world and we are told, especially in the social justice world, that the pieces are, are really all there. We just need to work harder, as if our sheer will can change the world. Approaching change as if it were a marathon, not a sprint, can help us to weather the inevitable defeats along the way without conflating them into total defeat, which makes us just want to quit. It can help us to see that change isn't a light switch that we just flip. It's a long, concerted effort, a journey that really lasts our whole lives, often working for something that we will never see, planting trees under whose shade we will never have a chance to try and quit. Maybe that sounds disappointing or even boring to you, but let me give you some pastoral advice this morning. Doing anything meaningful often involves disappointment and boredom. So we learn to work alongside that. Take a break, regroup, breathe and rest and recharge and find your center again. Have a snack, or better yet, have a good meal with friends and eat some dessert. <laughs> Dedicate 15 minutes a day to scratch your pet behind their ears. You'll both be better for it. Set down your phone on purpose. If you're early to a meeting or to a, a meal that you're going to share with your friends, resist the habit of scrolling through social media. Set it down and observe what is going on around you. What you'll likely observe is a bunch of people on their phones. 
but do it anyway. Take a walk, because rest also doesn't just mean being still. Practice some prayer, sing a song, play an instrument. Take some time to just be. After all, God created us as human beings. It's why our tradition builds in this dedication to a Sabbath day. First, because it recognizes the physical, mental, and spiritual need for rest. And then also because it offers us time to breathe and reflect, which helps us confront our inner selves, our inner dialogue, to heal some of those wounds that we have, to make some different choices about which part of us we're going to feed and to find, or maybe to renew, our purpose and our clarity. So my spiritual advice to you this week, friends, is take a nap. Turn off the TV. Eat a salad every once in a while for crying out loud. (laughs) Seek and create and pursue the things that bring you joy. And if you don't know what those things are, now is the time to find them. Because that, too, is changing the world. Amen. Amen. I see a joy. Sharon and Wayne came in through the door. Friendship cancer. Sharon got to ring the bell at the Cancer Treatment Center, so yay! We're happy to have you here in our midst, dear. Um, Speaking of cancer, I want to ask you prayers for you to continue to pray for our companions that are struggling with cancer. Um, I specifically, uh, Sue Bentley's sister, Cindy, uh, she has metastatic cancer. Please continue to pray for Eileen as she's in her treatment for cancer, for Steve Harper with leukemia. Um, those are the ones that I, that's at the top of my head right now. Uh, also, uh, Steve's partner, Norman, has headaches chronically because of his neck disc. And uh, Mark Gowen's friend, Gina, has heart issues that he asks prayers for. And there's also um, uh, Charlie. This is um, Kathy Newsman's son. He's going to have heart surgery this week, so she asks prayers for that. Continue to pray for Danielle as she's seeking employment. And for our friend, Mary Shaw, who has chronic health issues. And Paul, Paul Frenzen uh, is having kidney stones. And for those of you who have suffered that, you know that that is not fun. So we pray for, for Paul there. And also, I want to um, bring to attention that there's uh, companions that you probably don't know, most of you, Um, Chuck and Gary and Emma, they belonged to a church that we, that was in existence a long time, a long time ago now, Community Hope. They lost their son and brother, um, Clark, suddenly from a heart attack, and they are very, very much grieving that, so we, we pray for them, and he will be having his service Tuesday. And I ask you also to please continue to pray for J.D., our pastor J.D., as he's uh, serving as a chaplain in Poland. Pray for his family, that they'll feel safe and be well taken care of. So let's do this now. Let's go ahead and close our eyes if you're comfortable. And let's pray together. And please feel free to name aloud the people and places that are on your heart so we can lift up together, okay? Let's pray right now.
compassionate God, thank you for hearing our prayers for the people and places that are on our hearts. We trust you to restore them to wholeness and to guide us in ways that we can be a part of their healing. God, in you we live and move and have our being. So as we immerse ourselves in the work that needs to be done, works of compassion, works of justice, work to put bread on the table, remind us to pause and take in the big picture of what lies before us. As we surrender to the providential flow of this ever-changing moment, Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, and our hearts to receive the signs of hope and the beauty that can be easily overlooked. Restore us, God, with your holy breath as we rest in your care, trusting that you will sustain us. We pray these things with Jesus, who taught a prayer like this. Our creator who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For you reign in the power that is love, now and always, amen. My friends, communion, as always, comes with a gluten-free option, and if you need that, just tell the servers as you come forward. All of the cups contain juice, not wine, and are reusable glass, which we sterilize after every service. And these are ways that we make sure everyone is welcome at this table and that we are responsible with our resources. So let us prepare ourselves for communion with this hymn as those who are assisting come forward. Here at this table, in this simple ritual, is where we enact a vision of God's grace, which is for everyone. It's where we really are humans being. Humans being? Human beings. That's probably the better way to say that. (laughs) Created as God created us, each of us in God's image. If you wish to take communion, you are welcome to do so. This table is open to all. Here, we remember this ancient story. A story in which, on the night before he was betrayed, Jesus gathered with his friends around a table. They gathered to have a meal together, as they had had a thousand times before. Only on this night, Jesus paused a little bit. 
and he looked at them, made a lot of deep eye contact in ways that made them a little uncomfortable. And he took the bread and kind of made a show of it. He broke it. And he shared it with them. He said, take and eat. As we eat this bread, it's like joining in the kingdom of God as if it were made in our bodies. After they had eaten, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out and he shared it with them and said, take and drink. As we drink this cup, we seal a new covenant of hope and peace and trust as if it were made in the essence of my life. And now, every time that we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we reseal that covenant all over again in his memory, ministering to you in his holy name. I give you this meal of solidarity.
well, one of these days, I'm just going to leave that, and y'all are going <laughs> to... It's going to shock you. Friends, all of the news about the life of our church is available in our weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for on the website at ucctulsa.org or on a sign-up sheet in the Narthex. You can also give online at our website or via the QR code on your bulletin or in the offering box in the back of the sanctuary uh, anytime during worship to support the work of this church both inside and beyond our walls. Outreach is still gathering for youth services for their back-to-school effort. Details are in the church newsletter, including a link where you can send items directly to them through their Amazon wish list if you want to do that. We want to make sure that they have the school supplies they need for the very specific population that they serve. Uh, And we know that school is going to be beginning here in another couple of weeks uh, when you do Like, it's all over the place as to when it actually starts. But let's say within three weeks, everybody will be back. So please pay attention to that as that happens. Next Sunday, we will also have uh, a back-to-school effort here and uh, be trying to send our kids and our teachers and administrators and staff uh, off to a new school year uh, with with the grace of God that will be very important for them to all have indeed. Friends, let us give thanks for all of these gifts in prayer. Gracious God, here are our gifts. Give us open hands. Here are our lives. Give us open hearts. Here are our words and deeds. Give us open minds. May this church be a blessing, and may you always draw our circle wider. Amen. Yeah, so we have a familiar song, but we've also added some choreography just to challenge, just to challenge folks. We have, uh, that is a song for affirming churches that goes way, way back, and lots of affirming churches use this song and have used it, it's like really in the repertoire, and some of them have this accompanying uh, percussive choreography that goes along. And sometimes we do it, and sometimes we don't. Welcome to fellowship. (laughs) And now, my friends, I send us forth out into what really is a beautiful day, for it takes all kinds of days, doesn't it? So I send us forth in peace. 
So go now in peace and pray for peace and wage a little peace and love one another, every single other. Amen. The light of Christ will accompany us out.